Hello, and welcome to Follow Your Curiosity, where we explore the ups and downs of the creative process and how to keep it moving. I'm your host, Nancy Norbeck. I am a writer, singer, improv comedy newbie, science fiction geek, and creativity coach who loves helping right-brained folks get unstuck. I am so excited to be coming to you with interviews and coaching calls to show you the depth and breadth both of creative pursuits and creative people, to give you some insight into their experiences, and to inspire you. I'm so excited to bring you the next two episodes. Actor Paul McGann has had a long and varied career that includes cult classic film with Mel and I, and TV shows including Horatio Hornblower and Luther. But for a lot of people, he's the eighth doctor from Doctor Who. This interview is a first in several ways. It's the first two-part Follow Your Curiosity episode, my first interview with the doctor, and as you'll hear, I am honored and thrilled to be bringing you Paul's very first podcast ever. In the first of two episodes recorded in May, we cover everything from how he and his brothers got started as actors, to the advice Bruce Robinson gave him after Withnail and I, to coronavirus lockdown. Of course, we also go down the Doctor Who rabbit hole, and I think you'll be especially intrigued to hear what he enjoys most about interacting with fans and what he's learned about the power of stories. Without further ado, here's part one of my conversation with Paul McGann. You know, today... um... Finally, I get to do a podcast. I've never been involved in a podcast before. I wondered about that. This is the very first time. That's so oh. cool. I'm so honored. <laughs> well, me too, and I'm slightly <laughs> excited. Um, it's only recently that, you know, particularly through the Suns, uh, I've got to listen to podcasts. And podcasts, of course, are now you know, the, almost the spirit of the age. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're kind of fantastic, aren't they? I'm, uh, I'm really enjoying them. Finding yeah. them out. I, it took me a long time to, to come around to the idea of them. And then I suddenly was addicted overnight. And then here I am with my own, which still kind of blows my mind. So thank you so much for doing this. I'm really, really psyched. I can, I'm, I'm just sorry that it took, but well, I mean, it's typical me. Uh, <laughs> I, I rarely forget, but I rarely, I'm, I'm, it normally takes a while. That's all right. We got here in the things. end. Yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not the quickest. As you will no doubt find. Oh, uh, that's all right. As we get to know each other. So I usually start with just like, you know, where where did you get started on your creative journey? How did you figure out that you weren't going to be a plumber or a tax accountant or, you know, whatever else you Mm. could, could have done, you know, was, was there something you did as a kid? I mean, I know you grew up in a fairly large family and Mm. certainly you are not the only actor in it. So I don't know if it was just, there was something in the water. (laughs) (laughs) I know oh, it looks. More yeah, to it, than that. <laughs> it looks. It looks that way. But uh, actually, nothing could be further from the truth. When I was a kid, uh, and as you mentioned, the family and the siblings. There are, of course, you know, for those for those that may not know, there are four boys. Uh, in I got three brothers and a sister, Claire, who's the baby. Um, uh, the boys are now or have been actors <clears throat> we were all we all sort of became actors around the same time uh back in about sort of the end of the 70s you know the 80s uh and i've been doing it ever since F- for myself i mean answer to your question i when i was a kid i think my only my dream i suppose my, my childlike dream and it, probably my only ambition was in sport that was my thing I was that kid, you know, mm-hmm. I was completely wrapped, even from, from a, a really early age. You know, my mum tells this story, uh, 1964 it must have been, the Tokyo Olympics was on. Um, I was four years old, three or four years old. And she came down, she said she was in bed, and uh, she woke my dad up and said, I can hear a noise, you know. And they were, they were worried that someone was in the house anyway. 
my dad being the brave one, he came downstairs and me and my brother, uh, my older brother, were watching the Tokyo Olympics, three or four in the morning. You know? <laughs> um, I can even still remember the, the, uh, the, the, the tune, good morning, Tokyo. You know, I can still remember the, you know, we must have had this tiny, as, as, as people did in those days, this tiny TV set, you know. Um, but there was, there was something about it. I can still remember it. I can still remember being hooked on the idea of it, the Olympic Games. What an idea, you know, for a kid like me. I was one of the converted to a kid like me. That was, that was kind of heavenly. And, and, of course, the next one was in Mexico. I remember that well and so on and so forth. By the time I was in the big school, um, I was 12 years old. The Munich Olympics happened in 72. And by that time, I just wanted to go. That's what, that's, that was my only ambition in life. I was blessed because I was a, um, I'm not a big guy, but I was all, but I'm, I'm quite small, but, but I was always strong and quick and light. And I was, I was quick on my feet and I was a good runner. You know, I was a, probably the, the, say the fastest kid in the school, you know, when we were little and then went to the big school and the same thing happened and it got me into it. You know? um, and um, my dream, I suppose, was to, was to do that. And I was a good kid, and 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 through the the teenage, when you know twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, um, I ran and I jumped, and I uh, that's what I did, and that was um, and travel, got to travel a bit doing it, uh, and did it to a pretty good standard, you know, so the sort of I suppose the kind of national school standard, so it was great, you know, it was and it was exciting, and, and there was possibilities in it, um, but like probably thousands like so many of us um by the time you get to wherever you are wherever you grow up uh you get to 16 17 and that sort of combination of I said, well, well let's just call them extramural excitements and um you know other things begin to creep in or impinge on your discipline or just or just you know are, are, are far more exciting at that time. The, the schoolwork goes by the board. That was me. I was typical. That, that's exactly what I did. Though I was talented, uh, I probably lacked the discipline or and the quality, and so didn't make the cut. And, and sport is like it's a bit like showbiz in that regard. It can be pretty brutal. Um, mm-hmm. So I just it just didn't happen. And I went instead. What I did at seventeen. Uh, and, I, and, I, and even in school, I was no high flyer, you know. My siblings are, you know, a couple of them particularly. Um, in fact, all of them are pretty bright, you know, very academic. I wasn't. And anyway, um, I followed my brother down to London. We grew up in Liverpool. Uh, London was 200 miles away. He'd already gone. He was two years ahead of me. So I went down with him and knocked around. And it was only really then, two, three years after that, that... Um, somebody persuaded me to audition for an acting school and I did and I was em- slightly embarrassed to do it um <laughs> well I was I just it was because p- partly p- perhaps partly because I don't know just something to do with I don't know what it was to do with I just but I felt slightly nervous and embarrassed to be doing it however and I just did this one audition at one place on one day uh, and I got in and that changed everything and I became an actor it's amazing. I trained yeah that's how it happened and, and um I don't know I could I could if if that hadn't have happened that day I'd have probably done something else um <laughs> I was even I remember even the same big brother <laughs> when I think back actually was looking out for me uh um more than I even could more than I realized at the time uh you know, I, I would do things like, I, I, don't, I also had it as a sort of side passion, if it can be called a passion. You know, I, I, I think, because I sort of adored my father, my late father, and I guess I wanted to please him in some way. Um, I remember my big brother almost physically stopping me from going into a recruiting office. Uh, wow. you know, yeah, yeah, that's maybe 18. Uh, my dad had been a, in the Royal Navy. Um, and so I wanted to do that. My brother said, no, 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 you, you, you stopped me doing that. So, so I, you know, you, you, if I'm trying to create the picture of a confused kid, mm-hmm. it's because I was, you know, I, I just was, I was a bit half-arsed. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. 
Um, but like so many times in life, sometimes you, you're not just in the right direction. And when you find yourself somewhere, you think, oh, wow, why didn't I, why didn't I realize this before? Anyway, I, I loved the train and I enjoyed the time. Uh, that was in London. That was at the, the RADA. That was, you know, the, the Royal Academy. This is a great school, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and as soon as I was in, aged, uh, what was I then, 18, 19, um, you know, and, and essentially what, what, what the schools are, are, it's a company. You know, you're in a group, maybe 20, 25 kids. You're together for a couple of years, two or three years. You're putting on all these shows. It's kind of safe. Away you go, you know. And then, uh, and I left there in 81, aged 21. And I've been an actor ever since. That's fantastic. But then they, they just throw you out into the, the cold, cruel world of, of <laughs> acting after that nice, cozy experience. You know what? Showbiz, showbiz ain't so, I don't know, showbiz ain't so much cruel as um, sports cruel, but, but showbiz is, I suppose, indifferent. I said, that's, mm. that's not the, it's not the same thing. It simply doesn't care about you. In, um, and I don't, I don't mean that to sound brutal, um, but showbiz... If it ain't you, or, or if you ain't getting it, it's because one of your rivals is getting it. Mm -hmm. uh, is getting the work. Um, it's not about you. You know, it's you don't need to worry about that. And there's something kind of, I guess, um, I, I quickly learned was, this, I suppose, a kind of comfort. Um, and it runs counter actually to how a lot of people could easily imagine performers, actors you know um and often how they're portrayed you know that that it's they're egomaniacs so it's all about fame and you know, celebrity or something when of course you know for, for 99 percent of them it couldn't be further from the truth you know most of us are i include myself you know are ensemble people company people you know that's the the, the buzz of it the, mm -hmm. the joy of it i've always i've always enjoyed that the most yeah of course there's a few empire builders and um star turns you know um but that's me and that's and and i just enjoyed it i i, I enjoyed it right from the off and and the brothers through some happy accidents we were, within a year or so we're also uh, we're also actors you know so uh, it's now become a small family business <laughs> be kind of kind of interesting though when you when you put it that way i mean because you all have that shared experience in that environment it must be very different than if you know you're the the lone person who's out here trying this thing that's so completely different from everybody else there must be a degree of comfort in that you yeah, kind I of think go so. yeah, yeah yeah we I all agree. get it i agree you know so, um yeah i mean had i been like the outlier in the family, it might. Yeah, just, I don't know. I can't remember anymore. But it, it, mm -hmm. of course, it would have been different you know, to be the, the to be the the individual. You know, um, you know. Whereas in my family and in my siblings as well, but the, particularly the boys, there are the four of us, but only five years between us. We're all the same age, really. Mm -hmm. We even at the beginning, we even I say in the first few years we even all shared an agent, the same agent represented all of us. Um, and that's, and I only say that because what, what that meant was, um, and sh this, she, this agent wouldn't have, wouldn't have taken it on, I guess, if, if we were, um, samey, you know, what's mm -hmm. the point in having two the same, you know, this is how agents work, you know, no, I can't, I'm not taking, I can't take you on because I've already got one of those, you know, that's, that's how they tend to, <laughs> to recruit. Yeah. Um, again, the indifference of it, but, but, um, whereas, you know, we, we were, we were sufficiently different though, almost exactly. We looked the same, we were the same age, um, but we all did different things, you know, um, so that was good. And we still do. Yeah. And it went well, you know, it went well from almost from the off. Uh, now I sound like some old lag. <laughs> it's been 40 years now, but uh, and it, it was a, 
in Britain then, uh, and the schools were stage schools, strictly. There was no, you know, because there were no lightweight cameras or mm -hmm. the, modern, the modern technology that we're, we're used to now. Um, I'm still attached to the school. I'm still, a, uh, I go back to the school that I was at, you know, to, to, uh, for different reasons, of course, you know, and I'm a bit envious of them now. They've got sort of film studios and different, you know, all the kit that we kind of wished we'd have. And I, I said that because, you know, I, I, again, I can distinctly remember being 19, being at this place, um, and happy to find, you know, that, that a large proportion of the kids that were there in my, in my year, in my term in, in the group, uh, were working class kids like me, you know, and a, um, similar to me, you know, not many of us really had seen a lot of theatre. Uh, our parents had simply hadn't gone to the theatre, they'd never taken us to the theatre. Yeah, of course, there were one or two that were steeped in it, you know, um, perhaps come from a different background. Some kids knew opera and had been to shows, maybe some kids had lived in London. Um, but uh, I was probably typical, you know. Um, we We became actors because of movie stars, films we'd seen, um, you know, in, 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 the, in the cultures and the backgrounds and the places that we come from. Um, you know, your way in was TV and film. Um, though when, you got, when we got to train, it was classical theatre. Mm -hmm. Because, and, and it's a great training. Uh, you know, it, uh, anyway, I'm not knocking it, it was fantastic, you know, and quick. Um, but that's different now, you know, but... Uh, you know, it, like I say, if, if I was that kid now, I, you know, you'd be making short films and probably, you know, radio plays and the like, you know. So, uh, so now I do sound like old lag, but uh, and and really, and the way that it worked was, again, back then was that if you wanted to progress or you know, any idea, any conception of of, have, of starting a career, um, firstly. The, the, the big obstacle was the union. Uh, mm -hmm. The UK equity union was still in those days and would be for another five or six years a closed shop. So um, until the Thatcher government stopped that. Um, so you needed to get into the union. You needed to get going. Um, and that was brutal because um, probably eight out of 10 of the kids that I trained with never even started because they couldn't get into the union. Anyway, I did. But, uh, got started and you if you wanted to be say if you dreamt like I was like I once I dreamt about the Olympics you know suddenly now that the fixation became trying to get into somebody's movie say that would like be that would like be going to the Olympics um but to get in a movie no one's going to give you a movie so first of all what you probably have to do is um, try and get into somebody's stage play then onto the tv get into something on the telly and hopefully somebody sees you and then puts you in a movie. And this was this sort of time honored way of doing it. And that's what happened to me. Um, you know, the old, the, and the maxim is still true, but you know, they used to say to us, just be good, be good in a hit mm -hmm. say, on, the, on the telly. Uh, and then you might get a movie and that's what happened. And I, I ended up in a movie. <laughs> And now that was my only ambition. And after that, <laughs> and I was 25 years old, and I thought, well, what happens next? What do I do now? You know, um, it's not funny because you know, my, um, I don't know that I'm that ambitious, really. I, I mean, is, is being ambitious important, um, really? And, and, and I don't know. I, I'm, I'm asking. I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> So, I don't you know, know. I think you'd get a lot of different answers to that question. So, yeah. But having young ambition, you know, I mean, it's, you know, maybe it's, uh, it fuels you, maybe it sort of drives you a little bit. But of course, you know, um, whatever. Like, you know, you can end up putting the ladder up against the wrong wall, as Joe Campbell would say. You know, you, you can just, you can go down the wrong thing. Anyway, um, so I've been doing it ever since, and I've been, I've been lucky. I'm still doing it. I'm happy doing it. I'll always do it because I'm not trained to do anything else. Um, and the, the, hopefully I'll always enjoy it. You know, I've got to see the world. I've got some, you know, I've raised a family on it like my siblings have. Um, there. So, did How you're... reflective. Maybe it's this lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> 
Because we're all in a lockdown. <laughs> I am. I'm in a lockdown. I know we all are. Certainly, but but you know the idea. Certainly, it's like it's become about you know the appreciation of simple things. You know, trying to suddenly you you these 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 strangest days and weeks. You know, now it's been weeks and weeks now. You know, suddenly um, contentment becomes the thing. Or ideas, mm-hmm. You know, stuff you never thought about before. You know, just to have sufficient, just to have space, to have space and means, you know, enough, just have enough. It's, it's okay. You right. Know, um, yeah. Yeah, the bar, the bar drops pretty quickly. Or it just all moves sideways or something. I don't know if it's... Ooh. I don't yeah, know if that could dropped. be. Maybe it's been raised. Maybe there's a, maybe there's a, there's a way of thinking, you know, that in fact... Maybe it or has. It's, or it's crystallized. Or, or I guess what I'm trying to say is that, you know, we've certainly simple, but better things have come into mm-hmm. have hoved into view. You know? Yeah. And uh, like all you hear most days here, I'm sure it's the same where you are, you know, is that when this is over, when this is past, you know, that it's to be hoped that we can sort of hang on to a little bit of that. Remember, mm-hmm. um, remember these things. Yeah. Especially things like the pollution free skies and things like that, but oh, nobody God. exactly expected. Yeah, the bird song. Yeah. The moon. The moon last night was just, you know, just magnificent. Um, yeah, clean air, cleaner air. I know. What a concept. <laughs> I'm, I've been so happy because it, because um, last year I discovered, rediscovered cycling. Somebody roped me into a to uh, to to a charity cycling event. You know, and I'd had a couple of bikes down the years. I'd, you know, I'd, I'd liked cycling as a kid, but this was a serious matter. You know, it was like a, it was like running a marathon on a bike. Mm-hmm. So, I, so I had to train for a few weeks for it. But I bought this nice bike, and uh, and now the bike is in the hall here, um, and now it's spring, of course. Here, um, it's been just joyous getting out around the hills where we live here. It's although we live in a city, it's you know, five minutes. It's one of those cities you can escape really quickly on a bike mm-hmm. to the countryside. So um, I've maintained my sanity just by, you know, I've become that old git on a bike. <laughs> I think we all have, you know, I'm, I'm going out for walks as often as I can just to get out of my house, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and see other people to whom I cannot speak and now mostly can't even see anything other than their eyes. So actually, this is a great treat. You have an entire face. It's great. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> I've never had any complaints. <laughs> so I'm I'm curious, since you said that your your parents never really took you to the theater, did they? How did they react when all four of you ended up becoming actors? I think that they. I mean, had they? Uh, I think had they had the means. Um, then they would have, you know, we we we, we might have gone to the theatre. Uh, you know, Liverpool was a place. It was, you know, wasn't inconceivable that people filled the theatres. You know, listened to music, and you know, it's one of those places. You know, it's a great city for that. Uh, and my parents, you know, were, were my mum sang in clubs. My dad was a musician. You know, so I, I guess I'm. I'm had things been slightly different, maybe we had more money or maybe they just thought theatre was too expensive. I don't think they thought it was an idle pursuit at all. Okay. Uh, and I can remember going once with my mum. Um, I must have been about 12, the only time we went. And we went to, to, to the local playhouse in Liverpool. Uh, and an actor called Richard Todd an Englishman who, bless him, had been amongst the first wave on Gold Beach. He, he was in that glider squadron, I think, that, that, that landed on wow. Pegasus Bridge on the 6th of June. Um, wow. The equity members, it was the equity members that started it. You know, <laughs> don't let anyone ever tell you different. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was the actors that spearheaded it. Anyway, but Todd, um, I guess, in a way, he was. I know because there's a statue of him now in Elstree, uh, uh, in the High Street in Elstree, where the studios are here. And uh, 
I guess he would be like like the English Audie Murphy or something, because after the war, they fitted him up for a film career, and he and he you know he shot war pictures. And anyway, there was a story called The Hasty Heart, and Todd, I went and met him probably in the fifties. They made this thing. It became a film. It was a film my mum liked. She would have seen it. Uh, and years later, in the seventies. He was touring it, the same actor, probably 25 years too old for the role. Mm -hmm. uh, and we went, and we went to see him. So um, there he was, you know. So I saw Richard Todd, the English Oldie Murphy, at the Liverpool Playhouse. Um, and I remember being quite moved by it. I'm moved by my mum's reactions to it. Mm. Uh, and, not, and remember feeling it's like not really quite knowing how to behave in a theatre. What did you do, you know? Um, um, but kind of liking it at the same time. Yeah. But um, in answer to your question, uh, I think they'd have been happy. And I know when it quickly happened, uh, and once we became actors, that is me and my brothers, within months, we were actually all working together. The only time we ever worked together on the stage. And we ended up in the West End of London in this musical, um, together, playing brothers. And it was a hit. How convenient. I know. <laughs> it was a hit. Um, we were in the West End for whatever, months and months. And um, my dad, before he died, he died young, my dad, he died in, in 84, but, but this was 82. And he came and he saw it. So, um, and any scepticism, I guess, that, he, that he'd had before. And I'm not sure that initially that he thought it was the, the sort of job for a chap. Mm -hmm. he didn't think it, I don't know that he thought it was man's work. I don't, I don't want to suggest that he was you know just uh he was a macho bonehead or anything he wasn't far from it but um he did, he was he was skeptical but it but, but he let us do it and um the joy was seeing him there on the opening night beaming you know <laughs> there we were there we were in this silly hit it was great you know and we could sing as well we were singing and playing and throwing ourselves around pretending to be dancers and um, <laughs> and, and, and that's how it happened, you know, and suddenly that's like, the younger brother, Stephen, that was his first job. He, he literally came down from school. He's, now his name's in lights in London. He's down in, you know, uh, I remember my dad wasn't pleased about that. Stephen's very bright, uh, like my little sister, you know, now they're scientists. He's an author. And, uh, but he initially left school to run away to the circus effectively. Mm -hmm. uh, so we could all be in the show. Um, but it all worked out in the end. I was going to say, it, it's clearly worked out well for him, too. I mean, he's been on Call the Midwife now for how long? <laughs> Among other things. So, yeah. Yeah. That's a great, I mean, that's a great thing for them, you know. Uh, I think that's into nine or ten seasons now. Yeah, I've lost track uh, now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, good for them. Mm -hmm. You know, because, because to, I suppose to find in this, in this game, in this profession, you know, to, to get anything even remotely stable um, is, is rare. Right. Um, and when it comes along, you know, you just grab it. So uh, anyway, there we are. There we are. So, so I guess if, if your parents were both musical, it was no great shock that you would have ended up in a musical. You must have done a fair bit of music at home when you were kids. We did again, you know, Liverpool was one of those places where um, I guess there's a kind of expectation and a little bit of um, fame attached to the place, you know, um, for that. So it's a music city, you know, and the Beatles had been, you know, sort of mm -hmm. taking, taking the world on from there just, you know, 10 years before that. Uh, kids kicked the football, played guitars. Um, Again, you know, the point being that it wasn't, even if you were working class, it wasn't inconceivable. It wasn't out of the question that you could think about doing something like that. Um, it was okay. You know, like in some areas, you know, kids end up, I don't know, boxing or they end up, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, often sports, it's either sport or, or showbiz, you know. Um, these are good outlets for places like that. And... Uh, I guess it was, you know, one of us was going to do it. Um, 
Joe, the older one, he was, you know, when he went to London before I did, uh, he was straight in the music business. You know, he was a songwriter, he was a player, he was trying to get a little record deal, you know, so we were, and Mark eventually, you know, Mark gets a stop, but he, Mark's two years younger than I am, but he, he became an actor before any of us. Because the, in 1980, when John Lennon was killed, Mark played him when the, the local theatre in Liverpool was looking for, because they quickly, probably indecently quickly, uh, put a show on about Lennon. Um, and they looked for a kid to play Lennon. My brother got the job. Ah. You know, you know, you know someone from the theatre literally came to a gig. He had a group at the time. He played this gig and somebody came up after, you know, just like in a film, some, you know, some from the theatre came after the when the gig was over and said, do you want to be an actor, you know, to him mm-hmm. and, the bass, to, and the bass player. Um, and to offer them an equity card and he, that was it. He was up and running. And he played John Lennon. That went into the West End, you know, so, um, and that's because he, he could play. And uh, so, so it was an advantage. It was an advantage to be able to sing a bit, play a bit. Um, uh, yeah. And Mark still does, you know, to this day, Mark, um, who curiously is 15 years older than John Lennon ever was, but still, <laughs> but still um, puts on these, a couple of times a year, puts on these fantastic uh, shows, uh, international shows, you know, shows the groups and sometimes orchestras um, um, based on Lennon. Because he's still, wow. Mark's still the kind of preeminent Lennon voice, the Lennon in, in, in impressionist, you know, you know um, and some, you know, um, there you go. I'm bigging up your brother. <laughs> You're allowed. <laughs> Just don't tell him. Just don't tell him. <laughs> Just make sure he'll never hear me. I'll, I'll find a way to upload it that says everyone yeah. but Mark can get this episode. <laughs> So you mentioned that, you know, when you got the movie, then you were sort of like, well, this is what I wanted. So now what? So how, you know, how did, how did that work after that? I mean, were you just kind of like, now what do I do? Or, or did the next thing come so quickly that it didn't matter? When um, the movie in question was with Nell and I, Mm -hmm. uh, and and, uh, with Nell was, it was a good movie, really good movie. Uh, but, but slightly strange, you know, but it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, later on it found its audience and now yes. it's become a kind of, you know, respected sort of almost a classic. Um, yeah, everybody watches it now, but, but when it was first released, uh, although we liked it, we thought it was great, you know, um, it didn't get a proper release really and kind of disappeared for a while. Um, and then found its feet later, you know, as the formats changed and, uh, but when I'd, when I'd made it, when we'd shot it and, and it had come out, and in an answer to your question, I can distinctly remember Bruce Robinson, who made With Nail, he wrote and directed it. Um, months later, he said to me, he rang me and he said, uh, he said, what are you doing? I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm reading stuff and your scripts are getting sent, you know, because, um, uh, you know, it, it sort of bumped our status up a little bit. And suddenly I was being sent scripts. It was nice, you know. Um, I was 26 years old, whatever it was. Um, and I can remember him saying to me, listen, listen, he said, don't wait for another one of them. Don't wait for another one like we just did. Uh, it ain't going to happen. And what he meant was, you know, I suppose what he was saying was take, don't drop the ball, get going, take mm-hmm. the next thing, just take the next thing. And I was, I, I he, he nailed it. I was waiting for something. Just like the thing we just done, you know. Um, uh, and well, suffice to say, I've never seen one since. So I'd have, I'd have still been waiting, you know, I'd have, um, staring out the window. But uh, so he was right, you know. So it's like just take the next one, just keep going. Um, so in a way, that's what happened. And, uh, um, and I've just been. That's really just what I've been doing ever since. Like I say, you know, being a. <clears throat> being an actor being a pro you just you know i've been jammy too you know that that i've been able down the years able to to do different things you know go back into the theater do radio and audio stuff you know get by on voice work occasionally be in somebody's film you know you never know more than a few weeks ahead 
um, mm -hmm. what's coming down the line at you, where you're going to be. Um, you know, you've got to get used to that first. Um, so my dad was right, really. You know, it isn't really a job for a sensible person. <laughs> um, never mind, never mind a man. Um, uh, but one gets used to it. I don't know what I'm going to be doing next. Except, you know, even in these lockdown days, uh, in this room, this is my son's, I'm sat in my son's bedroom here. Uh, he was a musician. So he's, 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 got, he's got a little recording facility here, which is great because it's meant that I've been able to do some audio work during the lockdown from home. You know, how lucky is that? Yeah. Uh, so, um, and I feel, you know, generally as i'm talking generally um you know that i've been i've been lucky i've been fortunate and continue to be lucky um you know blessed in that way that you know i'm able just to keep going um, because i still really like it yeah I still, I still really like it and it's sociable you know um like i say i've got to travel the world and I don't just mean, you know, turning left on airplanes, you know, yeah, that's happened once or twice, but, and that's a hoot, you know, but just what I mean is, you know, just, you know, seeing things perhaps that I wouldn't have done otherwise. It's been great, you know, long may it continue. When recently, when, uh, just before we got locked down, if I can, when I think it's like another age now to, to, to remember, but it was only in March. I know. <laughs> uh, I was at a show. We went to a, we went to a convention in, in Pensacola. Um, and now when I think, it's just whatever, just a few weeks ago, but it could, you, you could be talking two years back. We got yeah. on, we, we flew on planes. Yeah. We went to airports. We walked on the beach. We went out to restaurants. The show had 35,000 people at it. Everyone hugged, everyone kissed, everyone shook hands. We laughed and we joked. This is just a few weeks back. Mm -hmm. um, you know, mad. Yeah. Strange times. And, and uh, but those shows and those and going to these, um, you know, which I do a few times a year. That's what I mean. I think it's, it's like it, that's got the spirit. Uh, I suppose what I'm, I'm what I'm trying to describe, the, that, that's the, these are things you can really enjoy. You know, you can enjoy this, like I say, the sociability of these things, the fun of it. Um, you know, it's work for some of us, but as well, you know, you, you've got to work when you get there, but um, it's joyous, you know. Uh, and, and in Pensacola, I, I traveled with and worked with um, a fantastic actor, which is actor Sean Phillips. You know, um, Sean, in my view, is a great actress. Uh, she's 87, I think. Good Lord. But, and still with more energy than I've got, more, you know, more, yeah, but, the, but, the, and working in the spirit that I'm, 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 I'm trying to, I'm, I'm talking mm -hmm. about, you know, it's never going to end. Um, you can do this, can, you can, you can do this caper for as long as you feel like. No one's going to tell you to stop. Anyway, we're not, we can't stop. <laughs> no one's, you know, there's no retiring for, for after this. I mean, there's, there's, there's less retiring now for all of us, I think, but, but, uh, right. but, if you're in, but if you're in showbiz, yeah, you know, you ain't going to retire. So, um, and that was lovely being with Sean. Um, anyway, just um, and as a reminder that uh, you know it's okay. Um, there's years to go. You know, it's just yeah. It's, it's just enjoy it. You know, enjoy yourself, which I try to do. You know, initially I was uh, particularly regarding uh, the uh, the conventions and having you know first got into Doctor Who and then the conventions came by that um you know ordinarily i would never have gone to one of these things um, mm -hmm. if you knew me you'd you know you'd, you'd you'd agree um and i was skeptical and rather nervous about the idea of going even after i'd started doing doctor who so it took a while but once i was persuaded and once i did one and realized actually you know it was kind of joyous um for the most part um i've been going back to them ever since and really having a ball you know it's interesting when you were talking about you know how how social it's been i thought it, you know there are there are two things that jump out at me with that the first is that i'm 
you know, I, I know that there are stories of people shouting lines from Withnail at you as you're walking down the street, which is yeah. obviously a social thing, whether you, in that moment you want it to be or not. And yet it is that simultaneous recognition and appreciation thing. And so that's one thing that's it's kind of its own phenomenon. As far as I know, there are not with nail conventions, though I could be wrong. And then you have the Doctor Who side, which is just exactly what you've just been talking about. In fact, this morning I thought, yeah, two months ago, I thought I was going to go to Long Island in November. Now no yeah. one knows. Yeah. But, you know, I've only been to a few of those. But But even so especially what struck me at Long Island last this past November is just how, I mean, you actually said it, that it feels like family. I think because everybody there obviously knows everybody so well because they've been doing this for so long. And right. so it's, it's not just someone shouting quotes in the street. It's like this whole shared experience, possibly also the rest of us being completely crazy about a tv show but but, but you're still. right but the, but the sociability <laughs> extends to the fans mostly you know down the years um and i've you know countless fans you know when we speak have said and they've been in a, in a group with other friends with fan friends they said now we met at one of the shows and they've known each other for years that's that's what i mean it's created mm -hmm. all these relationships and these uh you know this 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 kind of almost family bond you're right about the long island gig uh, long island who um that's a particular favorite of mine it's often nearly always in the week of my birthday so <laughs> well yeah but but it, that's yes, important. Beside birthday cards <laughs> yeah so it's so it's a treat you know uh because you know, we can have a shindig and no one's going to stop us and um you know, the, the few years that we've been going there, you know, like you say, it's familiar faces. So there's that, you know, there's that. And that's, mm -hmm. that's really, that's really nice. And it's, and it's small enough to, to control, um, you know, obviously some of the big shows are fairly corporate and, 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 and aren't the same, you know, they can be quite hair raising. Um, but the littler ones, I just think are great, you know, and in a way, what a joy, you know, who, whether it's Doctor Who or whatever, what, you know, whatever people are turning up for. Um, for us, I mean, you know, I, I find myself saying the same at the shows, you know, if asked the question, you know, although we're working, uh, you know, the performers there, um, we're all fans too. You know, we're all fans to some degrees of lots of stuff. Um, and there is a real joy in, to say with the who thing of getting together to talk about the thing that you all dig um, mm -hmm. for, and for for performers you know, like, like it's quite normal for say you do a movie as an actor say you do a movie particularly a movie it might be a year before anyone ever sees the thing by that time if you're, if you're jammy like me you may have done two or three other things so it's like it's way done and nobody really who's going to get together and talk about it. you know aside, aside from going on publicity junkets, that's it. Whereas, you know, we, when, when we get together in these fan conventions, um, you know, one of the things actors love, and particularly when you're in the theatre, for example, it's instantaneous. You know, you can, you can talk to the audience in the bar after the show. Mm -hmm. talk, talk about the thing you've just seen. It's gonna, you know, and there's a joy in that. Um, and it's nice as a performer to hear feedback, you know, good, bad, and indifferent. Anyway, it's just part of it, you know, because we're interested. So, so these fans, so in that way, the, um, when they're at their best, these fan shows and conventions are, you know, they're, they're just a, an intense version of that. We love talking about the work, actually. Um, well, people say, oh, you must get tired of it. No, actually, no, I don't. Um, <laughs> you, why would you? Because it kind of changes and as, as the weeks and the months and the years go by. You know, you, it, like, let's look at with now, you know, you may have done something 30 years ago. But new people keep coming to it. New people are coming to it with huge enthusiasm, and, and for them, it's you know, it's it's new. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then, of course, you know, time and distance from these things does, does plays peculiar tricks on your brain. And um, in the end, these people become, uh, say, with with mail or anything that's like decades ago. Um, you know, you do, uh, you yourself begin to forget about these things. So it's up to the fans to remember for you. Uh, I think.
Oh, that's some of us are frighteningly good at that. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember that reminds me of uh, um, who was it? um, Who was it? Friend uh, who wrote the David? Oh, Nick. um, He wrote. He wrote a book about David Bowie, and Bowie actually wrote to him. And it was this book was so well researched, and Bowie actually paid him the compliment of writing him a letter. But chiefly to thank him, he said, thank, he said, cheers, man. He said, there was like an 18 month period between 1972. I can't remember a thing. And you've like, <laughs> <laughs> you filled the gap in for me. You know, so you're performing a public service. You know, and sometimes fans do that and, and put you right. Yeah. And remind you, no, 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 <laughs> no, no. In fact, you did this then. And then you said that. And so there you go. Yeah. Well, I like that. And, you know, I, I feel like, you know, there's plenty of things that come between with Nell and, and Doctor Who, but since we're there. So, did. So there's there two. Right there. Yeah. <laughs> well, in a way, you know, I mean, I. Because I, part of what I'm wondering is, especially because, you know, it was what, somewhere around 94, 95, since the movie aired in 96, I would guess. Hmm. If did you have any clue that whether or not that movie turned into anything else, you were going to be doing this for the rest of your life? Well, how, well, well let's let's rewind, of course. Um, and it's difficult to remember how one felt, but but the fact of the matter was in '96 that we shot a pilot, a TV right. pilot, which was meant had it been successful, to go to series. Uh, the idea was that the, we shot it in a, the winter time, and we turned up in a January, 96. Uh, and I think the idea was that if the thing had been successful, then a series would be mounted in the autumn of that year, perhaps the October of the same year. So we were working under the assumption, partly, that we'd all return back to Vancouver uh, if this goes well, um, and I had signed, again, just to get the facts straight, I'd signed a standard uh, contract. When you shoot a pilot, you have to sign a contract before you shoot it, otherwise you don't, you don't get to shoot it, to say that if this thing goes, you're, you're going to go with it. Uh, and basically they've got you for five or six years, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. But that's that, and that's standard. So um, that could have happened. And at that time, we, um, it, it, had it happened, we, that is me, um, my wife and children, would have relocated to Vancouver uh, for five years. The kids would probably have been little Canadians and we'd have gone, you know, they'd gone to school. <laughs> well, yeah, they'd have gone to school there. And, and even while we were making it, um, I, can, I can remember that, the, you know, we were in the little time that there was to do it, we, we were asked to look at uh, or think about schools, look at the local schools, a mm-hmm. cu- couple of houses in the bay, this kind of thing, because... Uh, and when I think um, now, when I think back, I think, well, of course, that's that's that, that, that's the only way to do it. Um, nobody, I don't, nobody said this ain't going, this ain't going. Mm-hmm. But of course, the odds on a pile, any pilot happening, are slim. Any pilot, because it's it's so competitive. But of course, you can't work in that spirit. You know, you have to assume that it's all going. Um, so that was the feeling. That was that was how we worked. Um, at that time, Doctor Who had in britain had been when did it leave 89 so mm-hmm. it was a, it was fully five six years since there'd been anything it, uh, uh, that we'd shot anything of course mccoy turned up and we we did the transfer so to speak you know um the handover um the my agent my agent my agent I'm, 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 i'll never tire of telling this story my agent um was janet fielding I've heard that she was my she was she was then working she, at my agent's office. She'd stopped working as an actor. She'd become an agent, and it just by pure coincidence, my agent was Tegan, um, <laughs> which uh, was lost on me 
for the fear of when when, when we met because we just didn't talk about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was the point? Um, and it was only really when we were shooting the pilots and Janet came over, she came to Vancouver, as agents do, just to check them. Five star hotels are all right, and the gold taps are working or whatever it is. <laughs> um, she, uh, so she was there. And it was only then in the first few days as it, as it began to, you know, in, 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 amidst all the nerves, you know, that I was feeling and um, that she was able to help, help the penny drop, really, help, help me realize what I was letting myself in for. And re- I, I remember there was one night, uh, forgive me if I've told you the story, but there was one, because it was all night shoots, that, that, pi- uh, that thing mm-hmm. was all about 10 minutes to midnight, so it was all night shoots, it was like a month of night shoots. Right. So we were there one in the morning in some back street somewhere in Vancouver, and it's cold. And I, remember the, it, I remember distinctly the first time that I encountered a, a teenage kid uh, who was interested, who stood and we talked on the set, you know, in between setups. And he was a Doctor Who fan. And Janet was there. I remember Janet was there. Uh, and he, he was quietly sort of wrapped and probably should have been in bed. He was so young. Um, <laughs> but he, he did, he, it was the first time that any, that, that, that I'd encountered a fan, a Doctor Who fan, reeling off without pause, without stopping to breathe a list of facts all in chronological order um and then and in between while he was speaking he twigged and we we, we must have had uh, parker hoods on yeah we were dressed for the cold mm-hmm. but despite being dressed the way we were he twigged who janet was and then began to tell her <laughs> everything she'd ever done kind of thing. <laughs> you know what i mean in about a minute and a half uh-huh uh, you know, one of those situations where you know you, you know what I'm talking about, and uh, and then he and then he left, or we were called away. And I remember Janet looking at me, and she said, "Now you get it. <laughs> <laughs> now you get it. Now you understand <laughs> where where you've landed." Uh, and I laughed, you know, and thinking, "Wow, wow, people don't just love this thing. You know, there's like serious um, commitment." PhD knowledge <laughs> of this, of this, uh, what, what was then, what, 30 years of mythology yeah. and, you know, uh, and I was amazed by that. I mean, oh my God. You know? um, and that's really never, that's never changed. You know, um, you're always, you know, you're, you're off, often one encounters these, uh, how, how can people hold that much history? And I mean, I love reading history books myself, but you know, I can't, I can't retain it all. Not, not in that way. Uh, and now it's gone to 50 odd years and you know these people are just fantastic a few years back um i was sat on a stage somewhere in uh in the states at a show you know, and you know we did a panel or there's a q a or whatever and i must have been asked some question uh, some perhaps with a bit of detail in it and i simply said i, I don't know i don't know and the, the young woman who asked the question from the floor said then what are you doing here? <gasps> and we, wow! Yeah, and there was, a, there was a sharp intake of breath, a little bit like you just did, in the hall, and then raucous laughter. <laughs> right. Um, because it is funny. You know, I mean, it's, it, and she meant it. Well, what are you doing? And it's a perfectly good question. You know, <laughs> you know you're, meant to, you're among the conoscenti, you know, or whatever. <laughs> Why haven't you done your homework? I kind of love that. <laughs> oh my! But that happens. You get it, you know. It, you know, it's funny when when you say how do how do people remember all of this? Because I'm sitting here going, I don't know how do I remember all of this? Because my one of my friends was a huge Mad Men fan, and we called her the Walking Encyclopedia of Mad Men, and I was the Walking Encyclopedia of Doctor Who, and. And all I can guess is, you know, I started watching it when I was 13 or 14 and just was, you know, never stopped. So I think some of it must just be osmosis. I, I don't, I don't know. And there are some things that I'm sure, you know, other people would be like, no, it was this. And I'm like, yeah, okay. But, but yeah, it, it is an interesting thing how some things stick with you and some things don't. But, you know, when, but like I say, to be so invested in it and hungry for it 
course, that's very human, and that's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. I've, always, I've always been thrilled at that idea. Um, and, uh, you know, we want stories. You know, we, we were all those small children that said, you know, you get read a story and you again, 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 again. You know, you just you want you mm -hmm. want to you want to hear it again. You, you know, you, you want to keep it close. You want to remember it. You want to, you know. And years later, it sort of resurfaces when you least expect it. And you think, how did I remember? You know, it's just the way we are. Something really, really important, I think, isn't there? Um, yeah. I mean, I'm talking way beyond my competence here, but but, <laughs> but, the, but there's something so. <laughs> but there's something important, isn't there, to us about fable stories you know mm -hmm. the attachment we have to them um you know having them sort of refashioned having them repurposed having them told back to us you know we never really some of us never really lose that joy that again 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 that sort of toddler childish joy and mm -hmm. you know even in the repetition there's something and you know and to think whether it's doctor who or you know anything like it um you know, these are these are these are fables and mythologies and heroes' journeys and stuff that you know we've we've long um, and anyway, those of us that have got children have seen it again. You know, seen seen the kids do exactly the way we were. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's it becomes sometimes it's all you have. You know, uh, but there's something something really thrilling about it. And so, and, and and when you go, and I can say, I can, you know, the the one of the the, the basic joy uh, of working as a performer is is the satisf satisfaction is the wrong word, but is that is is to be telling stories, is to be mm -hmm. part of it, is to be, you know simply doing that yeah you pay to you know in a way you'd pay to do that you pay to to be yeah. able to do that you know wouldn't you I would. yeah now i know well, what and, it feels like <laughs> and, but you know i think it's interesting that it, you know you you've brought this up because so long island in 2016 which was the weekend after a certain election um was the first who event that i'd ever been to and i guess it was because of that that then a week or so later when november 23rd rolled around mm -hmm. i thought i want to make a list of all the things i've learned from watching this show and i thought that it would all be silly things like reverse the polarity of the neutron flow but it turns out you run out of those in a hurry yeah. And yeah. then I think I had, I don't know, maybe 20, 25 things. And I suddenly realized it was the 53rd anniversary. I'm like, I'm going to see if I can come up with 53 things, which is such a phenomenally geeky thing to do. Uh, but, but I was so intrigued by it as I did it because I realized when, you know, in the process and then when I was finished, I thought, you know, watching this show actually like totally made me the person I am. The things that are on this list, you know, like always cheer for the underdog mm. and the underdog may not be who you think it is, it, you mm. know, and um, ugh, plenty of other stuff that, you know, like you can save the universe with a kettle and some string, <laughs> you know, yeah. stuff like that. It, Everybody I just knows suddenly, that. Right. You know, um, but I just thought, wow, you know, of all the things that I thought I learned different things from and that had shaped me into who I am, this is the one thing I never thought about, but it clearly has had so much more of an influence. You know, the whole don't be afraid to question authority and, you know, all of that. Cause, yeah. because the doctor is so not your typical hero, you know, it's like Stephen Moffat's description a couple of years ago, you know, they, they didn't give him a gun. They gave him a screwdriver to fix things. You know, they gave him two hearts They you know, and, and I thought, yeah, this, this really is where a lot of my go out and do good things and help the people who need to be helped. And, Right. You know, that kind of stuff came from and it yeah. really really blew me away 
But I think that may be part of why that character in the show has lasted so long is just because it is such an unconventional hero that speaks to people in a way that Jack Ryan doesn't. I agree. I agree with that. You know, he's now she, um, you know, perhaps part fugitive, Trevor mm -hmm. can't, can't go home for some reason, you know, there's already a distance is out, you know, is out, is out traveling, um, you know, uh, the other day I was, what was I watching? Um, one of my kids showed me uh, a film of Dave Chappelle receiving the Mark Twain award uh, in, uh, where, where would that have been? Probably Washington. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Chappelle was this great comedian, obviously, he, but in the the last thing he said, and the thing that, you know, amongst other, he's, he's never lost for words, but but um, he said, just remember, always remember, he said, be, be kind and unafraid. And it was the way he said it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I've heard that before. <laughs> but I mean, in the end, it's distilled into, it's the same thing. You know, um, whether it's the doctor, whether it's, you know, wh whichever character, whichever mythological character, whichever, whatever we've, you know, whatever we're identifying with, uh, the lesson seems to be the same, you know, uh, and it's reduced to that. And, and quite right, too, you know, try not to be, don't be afraid and just and tend to kindness. And that's the doctor, mm -hmm. isn't it? Um, anyway, I just, I just remembered that. But. And when you said that, I, it reminded me again of the times that I've uh, particularly sat at the shows, you know, some of the big shows even, particularly the more, the more crowded ones. And there you are, you know, uh, there's, there's a trestle table, there's a line of people, there's work to do, there's a crowd, you know. Um, and in the line in front of you, um, and... and, and you sort of get used to f seeing them. There's, there's, a, there's, there's, there's in very, there's, a, there's an, in, there's, there's a person um, in the line who you're going any minute now you're going to get to talk to, um, to whom it means something. But, uh, mm -hmm. but I mean, it means something heartfelt. Something's happened, say something. Um, And it might be, and usually what happens is, um, what I like to try to do is, I, I really want to talk to these people. So, and it's often impossible in in a, in a crowd. So, maybe you come around here, or we can go there, or we sit there, or and 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 in three or four or five minutes, you know, they can talk, and they, and and one often hears the same thing. It's like you you may not realize. But without you, not me, the doctor, without mm -hmm. um, this got me through such and such a thing. When my father, you know, it's, it's, this, it's this kind of thing. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this is because, you know, aside from the, you know, the, 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 the attachment that the, we were speaking about, that this, some, I find this incredible that people um, really genuinely draw strength and inspiration for if i hadn't seen it if i hadn't met mm -hmm. these people and spoken to you i would perhaps have only read about such things um and i'm grateful is what i'm trying to i guess is what i'm what i'm trying to say in mentioning it that that um to hear it firsthand stories mean sometimes the world to people yes they're, they're the difference between the power, the, the the potency of them can be the difference between they can they can save your morale. They can they can tip you that way instead of that way. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Uh, and I only I can only say that because I've I've talked to these people, I've seen it firsthand, and it's been an it's been an education aside from anything else. Um, and I'd say a vindication. It's nothing to do with me, but but but. Um, Again, it only increases the, the kind of the sort of joy of doing this kind of thing um, because it's it's all of a piece, you know. What a what a thrill! 
to have and a privilege actually and i mean that to have to have landed in something to be part of something you know that that in fact can be a source of you know Mm -hmm. and you know before that's serious territory but for the most part it's just a hoot (laughs) you know you go to the shows and the real spirit of the shows is the cosplay it's people Mm -hmm. dressing up that's what it is it's people dressing up in tinfoil and shaking that to it. It's great. That's, that's it. That's, yeah, and that's that, some of the that's, things that people that's do are the level amazing. Of it. I love it. The show, you can go and show off. You know, yes. I've, I've been in, we were at one, there's one show in New Zealand. I think it's in um, um, Welling. It's not in Wellington. It's in, um, oh God, I've got lockdown memory. Anyway, in one of the, t- <laughs> in one of the towns, um, I was told about on on the Saturday, you know, there's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday show, and on the Saturday, fully half of the town is there, including the dignitaries. Probably there's the mayor in his or her wow, and they all dress up. You know what I mean? And and that's what I mean. It's just a hoot. It's a hoot. And and let's not forget, it's meant to be a hoot. Right. It's, It's meant to be a thrill. You know, you're meant to laugh. It's meant to be, that's how it's meant to be. Uh, but like I say, in combination with, um, I'm trying to describe the experience from where the like me would sit mm-hmm. or McCoy or wherever it is, would be um, occasionally, you know, you're, it's, it's, it's also, you, you see this, this other side of it, this heartfelt side of it, which is kind of, which is amazing. You know, that's why we do it. That's why we go back. And that's why, you know, it's, it's there, there we are. Yeah. Well, you know, at that, that first Long Island, I had, I had a picture taken with you and Peter Davison and Colin Baker. Did I smile? Actually, you looked very intense. (laughs) (laughs) Did I? You, you were, you were ready, ready to go beat bad guys in that picture. I've I've, I've got two settings. (laughs) You you, you must, it must've been a Friday. I think it was a Saturday actually, but, um, Maybe it was the morning after my birthday or something. (laughs) But I did, you know, have to tell Peter Davison that he got me through high school, which got quite the reaction from Colin Baker. He was like, he did. (laughs) I'm like, no, no, I love you all, but really. (laughs) But it was one of those things that was like, yeah, this is my chance to say that. So I'm going to say it. I might not ever get a chance again. And, you know, there were plenty of people waiting, so I didn't go into detail. Quite right. Quite right. But yeah, I mean, and it was when I started writing, you know, I started writing fan fiction before I knew what fan fiction was. And I put my best friend in it with me because that's what you do when you're 15. And, you know, I mean, I still write. So having having that (laughs) other universe to play in you know gave me an escape from a whole lot of stuff when i was that age so you see what yeah. we started i know you know and it but ramifies yeah. and ramifies and uh, you know and um, again one of the joyous things actually about doctor who particularly doctor who um is that most the, the, and probably the, the the biggest reason that it's endured is that is that fans have looked after it. Genuine fans ended up running the shows, writing the episodes. Right. In Capaldi's case and Tennant's case, <laughs> being in it, playing the doctor in it. You know, these are serious yes. fans. You know, that, that, um, the, the, the fans themselves became the custodians of it. You know. Which which is amazing to me in so many ways. I mean, it, you know, I, I talked to Rob Shearman in the first episode of this podcast. And here's this guy who's just like, you know, writing stuff for fun, writing stuff for Big Finish. And, and then he writes one of the best yeah. episodes of the new series. Yeah. And and there it is, you know, and, and the same with, you know, Nick Briggs will forever be the voice of the Daleks because he started doing it, doing goofy fan videos you know, 20, 30 years ago and, and then moving into big finish. And, yeah. and actually I should say for anybody who's listening, who's not a total doctor who geek, big finish does doctor who audio plays. And it started out as a bunch of geeky fans and now they have a legit business and they do amazing, amazing things. And if it weren't for them, the eighth doctor here would have been on TV once and never yeah. heard from again, but you actually, <clears throat> you, 
you had the the like the most you're the most ironic doctor because you've been on TV so little but you had the book series and the comic series and now the big finish stuff and for a while you were the longest reigning even though you had been on TV the least they call me the longest and the shortest yeah for various reasons <laughs> And then there was, and, and I hadn't realized this, I guess probably until Human Nature and the Family of Blood aired with David Tennant, and they had mm. the retrospective with the illustrations in the journal and all of the previous doctors, and you were in there, and there were people saying, see, he really does count. And I thought, you mean there was anybody who thought he didn't? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, oh, yeah. I, I had not realized that at all. I was horrified. Well, yeah, there was, uh, what well, I'm here to tell you, there was, uh, you know, after we, after the pilot failed, to, you know, it failed its, its only function, there mm -hmm. wasn't a series, it, there wasn't a series made. And that was bec before anybody called it the movie. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, those next, of course, you still had a decade before uh, Doctor Who came back on TV, 2005, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. So, you know, nine years uh, and in the, in in that time um it was easy to think that this iteration this uh number eight would probably go the way of peter cushing <laughs> you know big, yeah. if, if this ever gets if this ever resurfaces they'll just nobody will talk about that one and um, um, they, they because they wouldn't have to they just mm -hmm. you know, la, be la 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 la. They just put their fingers in their ears and and get on with it, you know. Um, and that was a. I remember thinking, oh well. Um, and it was a mixed blessing in a way, you know, because uh, that's okay, you know. When you work as an actor, some things work, some things don't. You 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 you're quickly doing something else, so that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, one puts it down to experience, you know. My kids weren't Canadians after all. <laughs> you know, you, you just go. You, you just within a, within a few weeks, you're doing another thing. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, and wh when it did come back, or when there was rumor that it was coming back, two thousand two, three, whatever, whatever, and then when it eventually arrived, um, I didn't get a single approach. There was no phone call, nothing. Um, I'm only saying that because had had there been even a, a thought of including the eighth. Mm -hmm. In the new, in the new thing, I would have been warned, primed, right, sounded out about, you know, uh, I was as was natural, uh, but nothing. So I thought, okay, um, and like I say, but I, I'd assumed that it would go like that, that they would simply just bypass eight, go straight to something else, and never mention him again. Um, unbeknownst to myself, Russell T. Davis um, was actually a, a great champion and was a was a, a huge advocate of. Uh, of of the Eighth Doctor, and it was really under his aegis that, uh, and and I read, I, I soon was reading in, um, you know, in magazine articles or hearing that, you know, uh, that he he was making it explicit that they owed something to the to the so called movie, mm -hmm. you know, that without it, you know, so now that was gratifying. It didn't mean I was ever going to be in it again, but but it was gratifying to hear that he. Um, and that's really how it happened. And, and um, but you're, you know, so you're, and I'm, I'm only half joking. It could easily have been because they, and they needn't have ever mentioned the, mm -hmm. the, the Vancouver pilots ever. Um, and like I say, any more than they seriously talk about Peter Cushing. There's no need. So they, because they can, it's, they can do it with the mythology what they like. Um, but gratifyingly and excitingly, they, they, um, he turned up. <laughs> he, he did, and, and, and I remember as well because the you know w once uh, Chris Eck and and the thing got up and running again, and there was Tennant, and you know suddenly now we're into other you know years in, um, and the publicity pictures. I remember the first pictures, and um, it was around that time that I started first was persuaded to go to conventions. And Big Finish started, I think, two thousand three. I think mm -hmm. was the first time I was, I was involved. Um, and suddenly, publicity photographs began to include the Eighth Doctor. Tentatively, at first, you'd see 
a bit like that child who misses his school photograph. <laughs> And and they include them. In, you know, he's got a cold on the day, kind of thing. And they include in a little cloud. You know, um, you know, the, uh, he, he would appear in the corner. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and there's Tennant. You know, doing handsome gurning in the middle. And um, <laughs> and, uh, and then suddenly, you know, over the months and the years, the eighth was working his way to the centre of the photograph. You know, I mean, I'm joking now, but but that's kind of that's how it that's how it happened. You know, mm-hmm. and suddenly there suddenly there's the lineups and there he is. You know, so it was a so. Um, it took a while, but but uh, you know he uh, he's back. You know he, he was accepted, um, and the first phone call, the first approach that I ever received, so to speak, was when Stephen Moffat rang, uh, and and uh, and we spoke, and he said, "Look," and this was for the fiftieth, mm-hmm. and he said, "You want to do this six minute thing." You know, if I, and that was the first phone call I'd, I'd had all, in all those years. Mm-hmm. That was it. Um, and so it came full circle. And I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no, I said, I said to him, um, this is literally on the phone. I said, well, uh, well, send me a script. He said, I haven't written it. I said, when do you want to do it? He said, next week. <laughs> he, said, he said, if you say, if you say yes, I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll write it. And this is how showbiz works, incidentally. If anyone, anyone that thinks, I know, you know, whatever you hear, Tom Hardy or whoever saying, oh, I did six months of prep for this. Nah, that's not, you know, they're, they're living on Olympus, those actors. <laughs> Most of us, it's like, are you available? We're starting on Tuesday. That's, that's, that, that's how showbiz works. Um, and that's, so when we did Night of the Doctor, that's how that took place in Sydney. And there it was, and then I was back in. Um, yeah, deep joy. Well, and you got to be a fabulous surprise with that. You know, right up there. You, you and Tom Baker were the great surprises that year. Well, we're talking, we're talking about because, of course, that was November. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, again, uh, it was around the Long Island time that that aired on my birthday. Oh, right! It, I forgot about that. It went out on the fourteenth of November. So, and of course, it should have gone out on the twenty second. But but uh, Stephen sent me a a text. It was about it was about eleven a.m. UK time, he said, uh, look, he said, I'm forced, I have to put this out now. He said, because someone's threatening to leak the thing. So mm-hmm. uh, so he said, brace yourself, happy birthday. And he, and he put it out, <laughs> and which, which is great in a way, because it, in one sense, because it meant that it had, if you will, it had a, it had a week to itself. It had a week clear. You know, there was, but by the, it should have gone, of course, with, you know, like a red mm-hmm. With the rest of the stuff on the twenty second or the twenty third, um, and uh, you know, but by then it had two three million YouTube hits. It had, it had a clear run, so it became a you know a nice thing. It of course celeb, you know, and it was a nice birthday present. Um, yeah, and and I think it's better that it you know wasn't in with everything else where it would have gotten lost. I can tell you that morning I was at work, and I started getting texts from friends who said, you need to go watch this link. And I said, I'm at work. I can't watch it right now. And they said, no, no, you need to go watch this and you need to do it now. Sneak into the ladies room, whatever you have to do, just go watch it because prom- I promise you, you don't want to be spoiled. And so I did have a fairly secluded desk at that point and my boss stepped out to go to a meeting. So there was nobody there. And I pulled out my phone and my headphones and I turned it on and I watched it. And the funny thing was, I, you know, I had no idea what to expect. So it was like, I recognized the voice, but I hadn't connected it. And then there you were. And I literally stood up at my desk with my hands in the air where no one could see me. And I was like, Oh my God, of all the things that I expected, this was just not one of them. And I think I probably watched it three times before lunch. But, but yeah, it was, it was, we had managed such a fabulous surprise to keep it secret. Yeah, which is amazing. It is amazing in the present era. Yeah, it is, you know, in the age of spoilers and which is, which is a spirit I just don't get. I don't understand it. I know it's out there, but you know, and and the reason, yeah, I don't either. The reason that Moffat (laughs) put it out is is precisely because, you know, a week earlier is because of that. Um, but up until that point, we'd kept it pretty much secret, um, which was quite satisfying, you know. Um, and it was great for, you know, it was great all round, you know. 
And I you finally it. got to regenerate. <laughs> <laughs> finally, we got the, you know, when you think like Colin Baker's never had one, you know, he's, he's yeah. still sore about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There Big is a Finish hierarchy, did a good you know. one for him, though. Yeah, Big Finish did. did do a good one with that. Yeah, but... and he reveled in it. <laughs> Which isn't really a great shot, considering. But but yeah, and Tom Baker at the end of Day of the Doctor was also something I wasn't expecting. So that that got to me too. But um in fact, you know, when um now I'm you're making me remember because when when I spoke with Stephen Moffat, I, I we were in Australia. Uh I was with Peter and Colin and McCoy like some <laughs> middle-aged boy band. We were like, we four of us on the, doing these shows in Australia. Uh, and also, of course, we had been picking up shots and making Peter's thing, the... the um, yes, the Five-ish Doctors, the five -ish which was doctors. fantastic. Yeah, which of course was predicated on the idea that, you know, none of us had been included in the film. Mm -hmm. and, and suddenly, and of course, and now Moffat's on the phone to me going, okay, listen, <laughs> uh, we'll do it but don't tell the others kind of thing because you know he, he, I, had to, I had to swear to secrecy about you know mm -hmm. off. so now I'm shooting the five-ish doctors thing which is all about you know as you remember right and yet I can't tell them <laughs> that I'm actually in the 50th <laughs> and they're not going to and I think the reason that I got away with it was because none of us expected Tom I think Tom's crime right. was, Tom's crime was a capital crime mine was just a you know, <laughs> was a minor misdemeanor but uh how funny when you think you know but we were having to keep secrets from each other and yet it all worked out beautifully it did i mean it really really did and it did and you know a lot of people were including me were especially excited that you know night of the doctor made all of your big finnish companions canon as much yeah. as doctor who has a canon what a good touch what a nice touch you know um I've said it before and I'll say it again, you know, rarely does one, six minutes long it might have been, but I can tell you, you know, in the, in the years that I've worked, I've rarely worked on something so well written. And mm. I mean that because when you think what he managed to do, to include in six minutes. Right. The way it's structured, there's a crash. He finds that girl, the Jess, is it? You find... Um, Jess? Yeah. Cass? Cass. What am I saying? Yeah. <laughs> Lockdown memory. And um, what's my name? What day is it? And, um, <laughs> the, you know, and then, um, that, of course, he meets the, the sisters. He mm -hmm. gets bored. He gets bored in the middle. Um, you know, bring me knitting. Uh, yeah. <laughs> then, there's, then there's a regeneration. All in six minutes. All yeah. in six minutes. Yeah. And you, ne and you never feel that you're being, like, it's hairing around. You never feel like it's, it's yeah. having a of light it's just it's it's phenomenally clever um and i remember at the time when we did um or rather when uh we shot it in cardiff i think we took it took us a day or a day and a bit of the next morning and Stephen actually handing me uh, a piece of paper with the with the list of names on it you know the the, the companions names. Mm -hmm. um i said here look here um say this mm -hmm. You know, um, and that's how we were working. And so the import of it, I suppose, it, it didn't really occur to me at the time. It was only when I, I think I was tr driven away or the next day thinking about it. I think, oh, wow. Um, yeah. I see what he's done. And and I know people who are going to be very pleased about that. You know? Well, um, and especially in your case, because, you know, there, there are all of the Eighth Doctor books, hmm. but they're just not the same as, as the audios. You know, when a friend of mine well, told me about yeah. them and she said, you know, you've never heard of Big Finish. And I said, no. And I went looking and I said, oh, wow. You know, it was just th this thing that I never thought we would get to experience was like, like we were saying before, you know, you want the story. And it's like, oh, look, he gets to have a story. I want to hear the story. And I'm yeah. kind of patchy all over the place with what I have and haven't listened to over the last it's funny you years. Say that, but, it's funny you said about, about the books, you know, um, again, because it's sometimes easy to forget, you know, that there are novels. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm a sort of booky person myself. You know, I love to read. But, um, and, you know, say the novels as compared to the audios, you know, I like to think that 
Uh, and there's nothing wrong with this at all. That, that even in, in some elements, in some respects, these are like alternative histories. You know, whether it's about mm. this this time war or that strand of whatever or that. Um, yeah. You know, and there's nothing wrong with that at all. You know, these are just like, they're not rival mythologies, but they're right. Uh, but but but, but and, and to me, they they have equal say and equal importance. There you go. Let's hear it for the books. Oh, the books are great, and the comics are great too. Yeah. Yeah. But but it's fun to have something that's almost the TV show. And in many ways, you know, I think the audios are often better than the TV show just because you don't have to worry about special effects. You could, you know, do whatever you want with them. And and they are so well written, generally well, you, speaking. So, the, so. I was thinking, you know, that, that it's you, the listener, mm -hmm. that, that supplies the special effects. Right. You know, the, uh, to work in radio is is... It's astonishing, you know. The, um, it's it's when it works. It's it's in fact, it can be the best thing, you know, to listen to. Mm -hmm. You're doing the work, you know. The world is as big as your imagination, or it's you know, it, it is what it is. And and um, uh, I remember Moffat saying, you know, that we was we were at a show, you know, describing his process and describing these episodes and you know making prophecies for the future and. Um, you know, and he was talking about this kind of thing, you know, that, that often the, it's the special effects sometimes which which can hold... Uh, he's mm -hmm. talking as a writer, I remember him, him speaking as a writer, you know, saying sometimes it's the special effects that he he, he doesn't dig so much. It's not like that. That's, right. the, that's just a special effect, you know, when he went... Whereas, you know, we, like, we were just, like I was just talking about the six-minute thing that he wrote, it was, it was just beautifully fashioned. And mm -hmm. it was writing. Uh, and words and and uh, moving the story along. Anyway, um, and he was, you know, he was adamant about that. I remember him saying uh, in a Q&A, you know, that, that he thought that perhaps the episodes, future TV episodes, because he was being asked about this, um, should probably go back to being, or might benefit from being much shorter again, go back to 25 minutes or, 30 minutes like they used to be back in the day you know take out what's now become actually a bit of filler you know mm -hmm. in case of that explosion you know what i mean that anyway that's another conversation but but uh you know for writers and for the likes of him you know i could see again going back to when we uh the day that we worked on uh night of the doctor uh he really enjoyed it he loved seeing uh, and I remember Mark Gatiss was there as well, uh, just in the room, you know, and and they're really good writers, those men, and and they you could see them really taking a real delight in that when writing works, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, for its own ends, you know. Yeah, and it, it's interesting that you say that with with Stephen Moffat because when the show came back in 2005, I was really afraid that it was going to be all big budget special effects and it would lose the actual storytelling that had always mm. made it work in spite of the fact that it had bargain basement special effects at best back in the old days, you know, the green bubble wrap and the yeah. wobbly sets and all of that. But the stories were so compelling that it didn't matter and you were still scared and you would go hide behind the sofa and all that. And so I thought, oh Lordy, you know, if they give it a real budget, and it becomes all special effects, then there's no point. And this, in a sense, was part of the... I, mean, again, I remember thinking of the, 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 the pilot we made in Canada. Um, this formed part of the criticism of it, or at least the scepticism about it, that it would, oh, no, they're going to ruin it. They're going to spend loads of money on it. It's all mm -hmm. going to be shiny and, and North American, you know, when in fact... <laughs> you know what I mean? So, yes. And I, I, I used to hear things like that. Oh, no, what are they doing, you know? But it's not meant to be, you know, on 35 mil and all shiny with this, that, that. So you're right. You know, this has always been a, it's been part of the, I won't say the charm. It's probably hackneyed now, but but it was part of, definitely part of what, you know, what drew people to it was, was mm -hmm. it was a little bit bargain basement, like you say, you know. Yeah, make, but it worked make, in spite of it. Amend. Yeah, it worked because of it, I think. Yeah, it's always been the little show that could. Yeah, and also, you know, he's only got a screwdriver, not a gun. You know, right. it, it, it is like, how are we going to get out of this? Aha, well, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's make them men. This is what it is. 
That's it for this week. Tune in next time for the second part of my conversation with Paul McGann, where, among other things, we talk about recording audio plays, Richard E. Grant, and why Paul left social media. In the meantime, check out the show notes at fycuriosity.com and come discuss the episode with us on Instagram at fycuriosity. And as always, if you enjoyed this episode, please do share it with a friend. Thanks so much. You can find show notes, the six creative beliefs that are screwing you up, and more at fycuriosity.com. I'd also love for you to join the conversation on Instagram. You'll find me at fycuriosity. Follow Your Curiosity is produced by me, Nancy Norbeck, with music by Joseph McDade. If you like Follow Your Curiosity, please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to tell your friends. It really helps me reach new listeners. See you next time.